Do the trashy pulp novels of the world have anything to offer? Are bestsellers all they're cracked up to be? Here at Terrible Book Club, we explore whether you really can judge a book by its cover or its ridiculous synopsis. You ever passed a book and thought, ugh, who's reading this? We probably are. Stone today we're talking with Everett Lester of Deathstroke. So this is a new look for you, the shaved head. Yeah, how do you like it? We were in Atlanta last week and Elton John's hairstylist got a hold of me. Hmm. Tell us, many people assume you are the very backbone and essence of Deathstroke. Would this group fall apart if you departed? <laughs> we're a team. We work well together. My style has con- contributed, I won't deny that, but Deathstroke wouldn't be Deathstroke without us four original guys. Your music and lyrics can be somewhat heavy at times, even depressing. Do you agree? Yeah, sure. Are the songs designed that way? The songs reflect who we are and what we're feeling. Some are depressing, some are upbeat and fun. Hey, that's life, isn't it? A roller coaster. It's been said that you had quite a tough childhood. I'm not making any excuses for our music, if that's what you're getting at. I mean, our popularity speaks for itself. Indeed, your popularity has soared. In fact, I don't think I've ever seen a band take off as Deathstroke has. Did you ever imagine you'd be such a universal star? Is this something you knew you wanted to do as a kid? When I was young, I knew I couldn't live an average life. In many ways, I was frustrated. I knew that I had to live to do something radical, or I wouldn't be around long. I had to break out. Music was the escape. Some of your albums and lyrics have carried an almost outspoken anti-religious theme. Why is that? Have you had bad experiences with religion in the past? I believe way too much emphasis has been placed on God in our country. Who has seen God? What has he done for me lately? What has he done for you? Jets fall out of the sky. People starve. Children are kidnapped. Earthquakes, floods, and disasters waste millions of lives. Where is God? I mean, get real. People talk about our show being a sham, a circus. But the biggest shame of the ages is the one about a supposedly loving God. Wow, that's uh, that's heavy. You sound bitter. Call it what you want. I've just had it with this fucking shit about God. (laughs) If he was really in charge, things would be different. How so? What is this, church? Haven't you got any other questions? Okay. Let's, uh, Let's talk about the Armageddon album. On this project, from start to finish, it seems that you are making a plea for people to follow you. You're making a statement that you have the answers to life's problems, almost as if you were kind of a chosen leader. Comment on that. Don't look too deeply. The bottom line is, there's freedom in our music. People who are hurting find release in our records because they reveal truth. There's a part of each of us that just needs to cut loose. Our records let you cut loose and be who you are. All of your records have parental advisories. They advocate adultery, drugs, sex, and violence. Does it ever concern you that... You don't get it, do you? There are no rules. My rules are as good as anyone's. Look at our following. Deathstroke has millions of fans around the world. We're millionaires. If we're so bad and so anti-religious, why hasn't this big bad God struck us down by now? Why are we so popular? I, I can't answer that. There is no God. That's the answer. We are the gods. You and drummer David Dibbs grew up together and were best friends. Is that right? Yep. Really, all the guys at Deathstroke grew up in the same neck of the woods, the rock and roll capital of the world. Cleveland, Ohio. What was your childhood like? My family lived in a tough neighborhood on the east side. My dad was gone, working or drinking most of the time. My mom raised us four kids. You were the youngest? Yeah, with two older brothers and a sister. Are they happy memories? No. What would you change about your childhood if you could go back in time? I would have had one. I would have gone on a picnic. I would have heard my mother and father say you did well. That's touching. Well, you have certainly done well, monetarily. Tell our readers, when did you and David Dibbs start the band, and how did it happen? 
One day we were all together at David's house, me, him, Ricky, and John. We sat around talking about life and school and how we were all kind of outcasts. We weren't jocks, we weren't brains, we were nobodies. And we decided to start a band right then and there. I guess we associated with becoming popular that way. So, Dibs borrowed his mom's station wagon and we all piled in and drove our, to our favorite music store in downtown Cleveland. It was a blizzard outside and pitch dark by four in the afternoon. We barely made it there. Together we went in on a Les Paul, a few drums, and a mic. The owner, a good friend of ours to this day, let us put the stuff on our layerway. We built our own amps in Skoog's garage, and that's when the magic started. The band was originally called Siren. Rumor has it that you and Dibs are not close anymore. What can you say about that? <laughs> Don't believe everything you hear. Hey, no doubt we've been through a lot together. Let's face it. When you hit it big like we have, it's hard to keep your sanity. I think our success has made us all a bit crazy and scattered. Are you happy? No. But you're a world-renowned star. A dark star. <laughs> oh, God. All right, Paris. All right. Uh, I fucked <clears throat> up a lot of parts during that because uh, I was trying to read it off my phone, but that was an excerpt from our latest <laughs> terrible book. Yeah, so... Um, Which was? <laughs> this book is called Dark Star, Confessions of a Rock Idol. It's by Creston Mapes. That's a name I've never heard before. Yeah, that sounds like a hell of made-up name to me. Yeah, it does not sound real. But he said his kid is named Creston, too, so maybe it's just like a... Really? They just went with that again no, after that? No, no, like, that's a pretty good one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> For, uh... Wait, I'm pretty sure it says, like, Creston Jr. Um, I like to be named after toothpaste. <laughs> This is my other son, Totalon. <laughs> well, Creston is pretty close to Crestron, which is like a, an <laughs> interface thing for um for oh, like that's a real thing, not Crestron, like kind yeah. of toothpaste transformer. <laughs> no. Like he fights other evil plaque robots uh, that live no. in your teeth. No. Um but anyway, yeah, so I guess let's start digging into this. That was uh, an excerpt from like a fake Rolling Stone interview yeah. that was placed in this book because this book is uh, basically about a super popular rock band that and their front man who renounces his evil ways in the name of Jesus. Yeah, so the, the basic plot is uh, Everett Lester is the very famous lead singer of the band Deathstroke. Which they formed when they were what, like fifteen, and apparently, yeah, I the mean, interview I, if, just said that they yeah, were. if you if you heard, also Deathstroke is a really lame ass name for a band. I mean, I'm, I'm I'm pretty sure there's already a bunch of those around everywhere. You know, I looked, and there are a couple of bands called Deathstroke, but none of them are particularly well known. But th you reminded me, there's two superheroes named Deathstroke. Yeah, one in the Marvel universe and one in the DC universe. I believe they might be like anti-heroes more than anything. Yeah. But the name Deathstroke just makes me think of autoerotic asphyxiation. Yeah, like, yeah it does. Like that's really the yep. whole thing I had on my mind. Um, I was kind of sad like that never came up because that's kind of like a no. sort of rock, cliche rock star -y yeah. thing a little bit nowadays. And this whole book, top to bottom, is like someone who only has an understanding of rock stardom or being a musician through cliches like that yeah so it's written by this guy who's obviously a very devout christian um you know disclaimer this book is all about uh being like born again and stuff so we're gonna get into probably some pretty heavy discussion about christianity and neither of us are christian so you know buckle up or maybe shut this off if you're if you're um super into religion because yeah i'm not necessarily here to poop on any religions for no no sake, but this particular brand of christianity right. i definitely do have a problem with yeah, I agree. I mean, like people can do whatever they want. Like, I'm not, I'm not going to tell someone it, it, they're this wrong. This is going to come out and most of my criticisms about criticisms about this book. But let's continue. Yeah, with yeah, just a just a you know a warning here. statement. Um, but anyway, Everett Lester is the singer for Deathstroke, and he's been doing for Murder Wank. Yes, uh, <laughs> he's been doing this for I think since the 80s or 70s or something. It sounds like late 80s. Okay, here's yeah, another no, thing. No, it had to be 70s. Well. I, maybe and, yeah because if he was 15 when he started the band he was 27 in 91 oh yeah you're right you're right sorry there's a sorry. lot of timeline bouncing yeah. around in this book uh, like not in a clear way like the last book kind of actually did that we yeah the... well i thought that the way um anyway so this book is written in a style where like it talks about present time which for this book is 2005 and then there are flashbacks to times in the 70s Foreign 80s time, 90s early, you know yeah 
it, 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 it's got this sort of there's a trial going on and they go go back in time to talk about the events that are being talked about in the trial yeah uh, i actually didn't on. mind the setup of it. it it was fine i thought that he did an okay job i mean it's a pretty easy way to frame stuff like that like there's plenty of stories that have done the it, it's at a trial or at like an investigation yeah kind of thing kind oh of... remember when you were when we were reading the cow book and you were like Plenty of books do this where they're like, oh, and this is the memoir I wrote. And I was like, I've never seen that before. And then this book did that. So, yeah, no, yeah, it's, was, it's super common. Yeah. like uh, He also is writing a memoir about this later on or something. And like this that. is the memoir is kind of, of course, the, naturally. Of course, yeah. That, again, it's just such an overused thing for or at least all the books that we've been reading have used it. Yeah, I know. It's been pretty common with bad books. Um, But so anyway, Everett, Everett Lester, singer of Deathstroke, it's all about his crazy drugs and babes lifestyle and um yeah, his, he has his, a psychic that he re- has on retainer what's her name again because i read endora this... crystal yeah yeah i this... mean her real name is something else but but she goes by that name she might as well effectively be called that yeah you know don't identity shame her <laughs> no 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 um so endora crystal is his psychic on retainer i still have no idea like how that even I don't know. He, she, he like just ran into her at some point. Some like party or something. Yeah, it was. It's kind of like the wild animus setup where they just oh they met and they knew they had to. Yeah, I don't and know. She's presented as this kind of like somewhat manipulative person that's like trying to feed off of his fame or something. Like yeah. That. So so Endora's whole deal is that she is trying to use Everett as a way to get people to renounce God, and they don't. They don't make too many mentions of Satan explicitly. They make it a couple of times, but mostly she wants people to believe in the other side, which is like the afterlife, but it's not heaven it's, or it's hell. It's sort of like the, uh-huh. the, 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 so it's like the Jewish conception of afterlife, where there's not really it's not a bad place or a good place. It's just the place you go after. Yeah, yeah. And she's saying like, no matter what you do, you're gonna end up in the same spot. So just act how you want, like do whatever you want. Yeah. Man. And so she keeps encouraging him to write these songs that are. Like you know, like kind of um, calling people to follow him and to renounce God and and all this it's, stuff. It's a little vague in that it's just yeah, like just generally oh, follow what I'm doing and maybe a little bit of like you're really free. If yeah, you listen yeah. To me. That's the that's the thing is she tries to encourage his quote freedom, and at one point he writes this really great song yeah, that's that, in the I book comment which on i the need... fact that like wait 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 no i found it oh, okay you found it so like yeah let's get a a reading of hey this, one. <laughs> yeah, that's the opening line. this literally has it has probably 30 e's in the word <laughs> hey like it's written it's written as though it's being yelled weary traveler come into my domain <laughs> hey weary traveler i got something to say <laughs> Oh god, I'm gonna die. Uh freedom, 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 freedom. Whoa! Whoa. <laughs> okay, really, and it yeah. goes on like this. Um Yeah, it's, um, the, 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 the lyrical transcriptions that occur here are uh real uh, <laughs> real top notch, I have to say. Yeah. Um and then, and then <laughs> there's uh the very end it's like the judgment day is a lie. Hey, weary traveler, every soul will survive. With like 80 eyes. It's very silly. Okay, so this is a perfect point for the question that I, I really <laughs> wanted to ask you at the opening of this. Um, What genre is Deathstroke? I don't think that they're heavy metal. They refer to them as heavy metal, but it might be because well, they let, started in context, like the 70s. Let's you want. Like, let's try to piece this out together because Yeah, I, I don't know. He claims to be heavy metal. But they don't. The lyrics read like seventies rock, maybe like a Led yeah. Zeppelin style of heavy metal or something like that. Maybe. But in like interviews and photo shoots, he's described as sort of a more like Marilyn Manson new metal goth shtick. Yeah, it's kind weird. Of a thing. Yeah, he's described as being like covered in tattoos, and he has some piercings, and his he's had everything from long hair to bald. And- At one point, it says he has like a shaved head. <laughs> Some kind of corpse paint and like a big fur coat on. Yeah. Like he's it's, some kind of ghost pimp. It's very like, weird. I don't know what style he's trying to like. What? Yeah. And again, I think I think the confusion um, is because this was written by a person who has no relation to any any sort of counterculture. Um, and so they're just like piecing it together from old Rolling Stones magazines and like. 
hoping that it sounds right. It sounds like he might have had a vague idea of rock bands, again, like in the 70s, maybe early 80s. And there's a lot of this mishmash of, like, cliche rock stardom yeah, ideas. Yeah, exactly. And how, like, the backstage works and, like, how much money they're getting. Because, first yeah. of all, if you're, like, a heavy metal band in, like, the 90s, right, is when, like, the heyday of his shit was uh, happening. 80s, 90s was heyday, It's yeah. like, I remember being taken aback because it's, like, it seems to be, like, early to mid-90s when all that hair metal shit was on the decline for sure. And you're getting more your grunge new metal kind of stuff. Maybe, I mean, maybe their sound changed. I don't know. Yeah, may, like it's never really clear. And I'm not quite no. sure where they fit in and why they're so popular. Yeah, they're, I mean, yeah, they're incredibly popular and it never really explains it. It just said that like some agent saw them playing a show when they were like 15 and they got signed at 15. And yeah, I the, was like, the classic, Ooh. like, oh, for hit, hidden rock star story mm. that, like, you hear in magazines a lot, but isn't the complete truth yeah. ever. I mean, then again, like, if this was happening in the 70s, that that is more yeah. in line with what was happening at the time, at that time. Obviously, that's no longer true. Um, I, I just was never able to get a clear picture of exactly what kind yeah. of music they were talking about here. I think it was more like probably like Twisted Sister, like hard rock, theatrical hard rock. Stuff. I picture something in between like uh, like, like Guns and Roses. Yeah. Kind and, of in the and same like realm. Led Zeppelin, like in somewhere in Maybe that Maybe Marilyn area. Manson. But a then bit. with like the aesthetic of yeah. new, late 90s, early 2000s, new metal. Yeah, kind of band it's pretty stuff. Confusing. Like the um, ghost pimp outfit was like the one that confused me the most because I was like, why would you? Yeah. That's like combining Axl Rose and Marilyn Manson into like this weird. Well, I mean, think about it. If, if you know, this person was writing this in the early 2000s, you know, that's who was. I guess, yeah. Kind of like. Well, Guns being... Roses wasn't. So, but yeah, again, it, it seems like someone that just has no idea how any of this. Yeah. actually works or happened beyond like a very cursory shallow understanding of it and like the amount of money that they, they're like death clock levels over here with like the amount of shit they can just get, have on hand oh no it's way it's way worse than that it's like i don't know who's the who's like the most well-paid the rolling stones probably yeah they're, they're them and like bruce springsteen and the e street band probably yeah. get like pulling the most ticket sales but like the rolling stones are definitely you too also yeah yeah so like imagine that level i mean we're talking like limos on demand private planes on demand like bitches and multiple drugs everywhere all, multiple all properties yep and dora crystal makes like six figures yeah he keeps her on retainer for like 30 grand a month I think it's way more than that. Uh, I think it was. We, we probably won't be month. able to find the statistic, but again, from what I remember, she it was some crazy ass number. No, I think it was thirty a month because think about that times twelve. Yeah, that's still six fit well into. Yeah, six that's range. crazy. But like, so all she really did was like hang out with him and like maybe provide a drug connect or two. And... No, she wasn't the drug person. It was another guy. Oh yeah, that's right. It was it was the uh, the um, more the, there was a bigger more muscly dude that yeah did that. there was a different guy but um and like hypnosis was her other thing yeah so she's like a hypnosis expert and basically like i'm just gonna ruin the plot right now so he's on trial for her murder yeah um, that's and, the whole conceit of this book and it, it's basically like when dora crystal was mysteriously shot and it, it seems like ever lester was the one at the scene at the time i mean he's basically caught red-handed because his like his fingerprints gun residue like he was the one that shot her but the fucking mystery the, like the secret is that andora hypnotized him to shoot her yeah this is the dumbest fucking play yeah. i've ever heard because so... for her it was like in order for him to reach more people or like make his message heard no more? no it was to ruin him because he had found god and become born again oh, and the only right. way she was going to be able to ruin his earthly life was to do something like this so she could serve the other side quote unquote why did she have to be the one to die in this i don't fucking know it could have been you anyone kill yourself in the plot like dude i don't know she literally could have hypnotized him and had him shoot any fucking other yeah, person any, it would have had the any, same any, effect any goddamn life it didn't have to be herself well i think i think the only reason i can come up with as to why she would make him shoot her was that it would look more damning because it would look like he had a clear motive yeah, but I like, guess, but there's honestly, plenty of other people yeah. in his entourage, and if he was so, like, unwound and crazy, which was kind of the case that they were trying yeah. to build, or at least, like, the the the, the, the Texas lawyer, Foghorn Leghorn guy. That was, <laughs> Foghorn like, Leghorn, yeah. Uh, it, like, but it didn't have to be Andorra. 
It could have been yeah. another band member. It, it could have been, been the band manager. It could have yeah, been anybody. Tor- the yeah, drug the, guy. Yeah. Like, it didn't yeah. have to really be anyone. It didn't have to be her. I know. And it's not like she was particularly longing for like her other side after life. No, she the wasn't. Book. She just decides like, well, it's going to have to be me right now. Yeah, it's really. I don't know. I mean, there is some subtext to indicate that. All the people who are, you know, quote, attached to Satan and the other side are maybe being slightly controlled by Satan. And maybe that's what it may be. So maybe it wasn't totally her will alone. Yeah. But that's the only explanation I can come up with in this world. Yeah. That- I, I, Satan is definitely like a real force at work in here, although his methods... He's really incompetent, though. <laughs> he's really incompetent. His methods are super roundabout. Yeah. Okay. So. All right. So we're... Let me let me just talk about how Satan's incompetent in this book. So, <laughs> so um, in this book, like Chris is I'm saying, just, look, man, like you, you try to keep track of like three billion. So yeah, it's really hard it's really- to be this evil. Like, <laughs> I know he's like a big rock star, and like he was supposed to be the same. But like, there's a lot of stuff I have to keep track of. Okay. Yeah, I know Satan needs an assistant, um, Mister Satan. I have. Rebecca, I have- could you uh, take this down to the fifth <sighs> level of hell for me? Um, like yeah, all but- these reports have to get I done know, like, but tomorrow. S- but Satan, you have a meeting in two minutes. I, I can't oh, leave. Look, I have to take I, I, minutes. These people need to be tortured for eternity, and they're going to be held up and not being tortured for like a couple of hours. And I can't have that, okay, Rebecca? I know, I so know. Get off my tail. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why that just happened. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, okay, so we're going to move back to uh, the actual book. How is Satan in conflict? So in this book, like Chris was saying, God, the concepts of like God and Satan are very real. Although God never really like shows up or does anything which is interesting as he you know is want to do really all yeah. the time right like i guess but for a book that's like that pushes the whole i don't know like very real aspect of evil god sure doesn't show up ever um it's basically up to everyone on earth to do the work for him yeah exactly and even though, i guess satan is, has to also have his hand more directly involved or something yeah it doesn't make any sense but anyway so god's pretty hands-off but people people do the right thing and they attribute it to god and i don't know protestants That's whatever the, the, um the thing like, about this is like my main problem issue with the whole book is that the way the whole co- conflict is basically everett decides to renounce his rock star sex drugs rock and roll lifestyle mm-hmm. and he comes to jesus and he realizes that oh i this is the right way to live yeah and as soon as he makes that switch everything starts getting magically better for him yeah exactly w- without him having to really do anything except like just make that decision one well night. except for getting arrested for murder that kind of blows yeah he does get arrested after he has the born yeah. again thing. well that that's because that's why andora did that because he accepted jesus yeah and- she was mad because he was supposed to accept Satan, I guess. But I don't still, know. like, it, it's just like a switch flips magically. Yeah. Like, as soon as he accepts that, then he becomes all buttoned up. He might as well be wearing a sweater vest. Yeah. All of his, like, super white bread now friends that yeah. are all... Cri- like, everyone that's a Christian is, like, super buttoned up. Yeah, like, everyone's white. And you know that Blonde, because, because whenever... Tall and handsome and beautiful. Whenever anyone shows up that isn't white, they describe them as black constantly. Yeah, it's like, pretty that, that's, ridiculous. like, the only descriptor they have for, yeah. like, one juror, I believe. Yeah, there were, there were a couple of other people, too, but it's just like, hey, you know that, that black juror? You know that black one? It's like, <laughs> oh, my God, can it's you like, please There's stop? other ways to describe people. Yeah, and... Uh, anyway. You know, and they don't describe anyone as white because the default is just, oh, of course the main characters are white. It's like, oh, Jesus. Anyway. That's, you know, just a little subtext to yeah. this, this kind of a thing. Uh, the Satan's, shit's from the Midwest. What can you expect? Yeah, let's get back to Satan's incompetence here because I want to oh. talk about like... So Satan's incompetence is like basically... Um, let's talk about... There's this fan, Karen Bayless, who has been writing to Everett for since she was like 10 years old or 12 or something. Like, as, like when Deathstrokes first started up basically yeah she's been writing to them for basically her whole life because she's like 28 now in the present time and she's been writing to him to try to convert him to jesus because when she was a kid she like saw him on tv or read about him and as an act of faith she decided like oh i'm gonna try to i'm gonna try to help somebody out and convert somebody who really needs help you know and in like you know in a small christian child's mind like obviously big bad rock star needs jesus so she's been writing to him for like 18 years or something crazy a, a like very that. lengthy amount of time like the yeah. first 10 lester just ignores them all the time and yeah. throws them away but he like remembers the name because he gets piles of fan mail yeah. and the name keeps popping up yeah again she's from topeka kansas so he always remembers like oh Topeka, kansas karen bayless and like eventually you know at this point in his life he starts 
reading, responding. And then because they, of his conflict about, oh, my life is, I'm not really happy. Yeah. Oh, that's this. right. That's right. Yeah. So, like, after all these years of, like, drugs and alcohol and women and, like, just kind of being a shithead, he, uh, he, they're at, they're playing a show and he gets so blackout drunk on stage that he throws, um, a, a mic stand with, like, a heavy bass off the stage and he puts a girl into a coma and he's like, oh my God, what the fuck have I done? Like, my life is getting out of control. Like I put this teenager in a coma, like, and that's kind of when he starts thinking like, all right, maybe I should listen to this Karen girl. Maybe I should check out this Jesus shit because my life is way out of control. And something else had happened before that too. Just the general, I don't remember. Like, he seems less stable into himself. Yeah. Yeah. He was just like, really, yeah, he was like really going off the deep end. Like all the years of drug use and stuff was really getting to him. And you know, I, get that like that's a reasonable thing to have yeah, that's, happen. A, that's a totally reasonable yeah. plot point that's probably the most reasonable thing in this book where i was like yeah no that's understandable yeah like where- just just think like if if you've known a life of like unlimited resources since you were like 15 yeah your decision making is probably pretty inhibited and especially since you have all the money and means to make anything go away you know you're just gonna kind of do whatever and anyway it finally catches up to him and he decides that he's gonna look into this Jesus thing and then he eventually goes to meet Karen and I didn't think this was going to happen at all but of course she ends up being like the love interest in the story and they end up I dating. I saw it coming a mile away. I don't know why I didn't. Maybe just because I was hoping it wouldn't happen. Well because for most of the book it doesn't. True but this is a very Christian book and like bachelor dumb in t- being like a single guy well into like your 40s or something like that mm-hmm. is a little bit taboo kind of a th- like being a womanizer sort of a thing so yeah. I knew eventually part of his coming to Jesus oh, thing right. was gonna be like I'll get married and be like abstinent until I'm married or yeah, something like exact- that. Yeah exactly. Yeah yeah. Which they right. definitely do. I think they actually do that. Yeah they like, do. They just they only hold hands. And kiss briefly. Yeah like w- like a little peck yeah. before they get married. Yeah. Because all of a sudden like as soon as he makes that choice of course he could be 100% chased after yeah. 30 years of not doing it. I don't think the switch flips that easily man. Yeah it's pretty weird. So. That's the other thing like because of that of that that nature of where it's just w- all the way one way and then all the way the other yeah, there's great. no transitionary period that's interesting to read about you know I think a real person would have a little bit more trouble going from one way to the other. Yeah, yeah. He doesn't really seem to have, like, any setbacks or lapses. Like, he just cuts drugs fucking cold turkey. Like... Because you can do that. Just do it. Yeah, just... I mean... The whole book yeah. seems to have, like, a very huge just misunderstanding fucking do it. Yeah. of, like, oh, if you just put your mind to it, in, everything instantly will change for yes. the better. That is exactly what it is. It's like, well, if you just make, if you just accept Jesus, then you'll suddenly start making all the right decisions. And it's like, well, that's not really that's how that works. That's my huge problem with this book. Um, in, like in, in the way that's written, it's not just the Christianity of it, because there's certain parts and certain sects of Christianity that are perfectly a Yeah, that's fine. But this very extra evangelical type that assumes that as soon as, you, oh, if you just make this promise to Jesus, then... Give yourself to him in servitude. The, the servitude yeah. part is very, very Well, yeah, emphasized. because because the funny thing is, like, they talk about how Karen, when she was a teenager, she got pregnant and had to have an abortion. And her dad, who was a minister, took her to get the abortion. And they both, after that, kind of realized, like, like her dad was like, I wasn't living for Jesus. You know, I was living for myself. The whole thing is about not living for yourself and, like, renouncing your kind of like Self, stake selfish in, desires yeah you're you're kind of like stake in your life and just doing everything for jesus and it seems really crazy to me i mean yeah like there, uh, it doesn't seem half healthy half thing to this where yeah. like being less selfish yes of course that's a good idea yeah, of but course. the way that this particular brand of christianity asks you to just perfectly submit to jesus which implies the church in general right kind of a thing even though that like you said Karen's father was kind of critical of the church to begin with. He's like, oh, they're all kind of like money mongers in the end a little bit too, or certain. Sections. Yeah, he was. He was ultimately like. At the same time, it's about the conflict between, I guess, Endora Crystal's side and the church here is that, oh, you can either be truly free without rules or give yourself in complete servitude to Christ. Those are your only choices. Yeah. And, and that's a very shitty binary. to be uh, Yeah, it's a terrible thing because that's not how it's supposed to work. No, that's not how life works. I mean, you, it's just don't be selfish. But at the same time, you don't have to submit to an authority. Yeah. Totally. 
No, you don't have to be a slave to anything, whether, you know, whether that's drugs or Jesus. Yeah, like, you, like, you know, it seems to me like he's just going from one, like yeah. being a slave to mm-hmm. this, to just another side well, of it. Well, that's why so many people who struggle with drug addiction end up becoming uh, religious, usually Christian. Um, they just, I just need something to control. Yeah. Mm-hmm. A lot of people do crave authority, apparently. They do. They, mm-hmm. they really just want to be told what to do. Well, because it's easier than shouldering the responsibility for decision making on yourself. I mean, trust me, I have to do it at work all the time. It's not fun always. <laughs> yeah, that, that's kind of one of the hard parts about, I think, becoming a more functioning adult person is learning how to accept. A lot of adults don't even get this. Plenty of them never even get to this point where it's about learning how to accept responsibility for your own decisions yeah. and it's making tough. your own choices by analyzing. Uh, I, I kind of lost my train of thought here. No, but-, but I know what you're saying. Like making your own choices by analyzing what the best option is without really knowing, like just making the best guess you can and not having anyone tell you. Cause like you get to a certain point in your life and no one's fucking making sure you go to the doctor or the dentist. No one's making sure you have food. Like no one's, no one is ensuring that your life is going according to plan except for you. Um, and whatever plan that is for you. Yeah. That, that, that's the other thing is that I kind of liked it. I didn't like, but like, and Dora's whole thing about like no gods, no masters, like mm-hmm. I half agree with a little, you know. Yeah, well, except her particular she, except brand she of did it, have her, a fucking her, master, her the method, hypocritical bitch. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> she, yeah, her method was wrong and everything, but of course, like you don't have to. S- you do have freedom of choice on how you want to live, but of course, it stops at where it hurts other people, and I think that's a reason reasonable line to have. I think the problem that I have with Christians of this variety is that they think if you don't have that deific authority over you at all times what's to stop you from being a horrible murderer rapist, yeah, yeah. drug abuser kind of type of person and it's like well how about the desire to just be an okay person inside of me because i understand what it's like to be hurt by others and i don't want to do that to other people i don't need the threat of hell to tell me to be a good person yeah of course and it's like if you constantly want to do bad things that's pretty fucked up man you might yeah, want to see only thing somebody keeping about you that from doing bad shit is like oh i might there might be a demon poking me forever at the uh, end of yeah. this and that's kind of like a shitty motivation to not be a jerk in my book yeah i i agree um, i guess if it works and it makes you a nicer person in the end oh uh, i'll i'll be, deal with it, it i guess if choice. i never have to find out about your creepy underlying desires the great but then but then you look at like a child sex abuse scandal in the catholic church and it's like well never mind guess that guess yeah. that doesn't actually work so um i don't know i mean people are terrible no matter what faith they follow or don't follow i guess but I think that I don't like the black this, and white yeah i was gonna say i think i think book. painting this very binary like you either follow Jesus or you follow Satan. You're either completely free or you have to com- completely submit yeah. to something. Or or the whole like, oh, you can't you can't be in a rock band and be a successful musician without doing drugs and alcohol and fucking people all the time. Except there's one character that is clean. Like their bassist, I think. Yeah, can we talk for a second about like the names? Oh, the Ricky beginning? Crazy. Ricky Crazy <laughs> with two E's at the Ricky end. Ricky Crazy. And they say that's Scoogs just his name. Scoogs the bass player. Scoogs. Or... Yeah, they say these are like all their actual names too. It's not like yeah, it's not, stage not like their names. nicknames or anything. It's just like, oh, his name was really Ricky Crazy. I think one of them had like a, a name shift or something. Scoogs, I think, was David Scoogs. One of them was like Jewish or something. Like they had to get one Jewish guy in there uh, or something. I don't remember. That might have been another character again. I kind of read this book a while ago yeah there's been a lot of stuff going on in our lives we're, we're, oh we're god in this. yeah i've i've had a very trying moving experience where i moved i finally recorded drums for the graveborn albums like, yeah that's, i've been preparing for that that's over with now but yeah so chris has been recording actually chris helped move three people in one weekend including me yeah i was dead for the next two days like my muscles hurt for like literally the whole two <laughs> days after that yeah and so anyway i moved and like there's still some furniture in my old house that i'm <laughs> freaking out about because I can't. I literally cannot move this couch out if you of. Accept Jesus into your life. The yeah, couch will move it's itself. It's true. It's us. true. I just need to accept, accept Jesus. Accept His love and the miracle of couch movement. And the mo- <laughs> um. So the couch in my old apartment. There's no way it'll fit into my new apartment. So we were just gonna have someone take it from us. But like, 
hasn't panned out yet and i only have three more weeks to deal with it so i'm panicking also the power got cut and there's food in the fridge and i have to go clean that at some point oh wow yeah, yeah. <laughs> everything's going wrong for you right yep. now um, you need to accept jesus into your life yeah and everything hey, will i know flip. let's see and then you're, so then you, the you'll first... have a bigger apartment you're you're <gasps> you'll spontaneously add an addition to the roof where you live wait no i have to keep going the first night in my new apartment my shower flooded the bathroom and rained onto the second floor where my friends that's, live that's satan um that's yeah it's satan definitely satan you, Paris, and then with let's more. see Mold. Yeah. <laughs> Mold. An, an instrument of Satan. Um, let's see. What else? I don't know. It's just kind of been like... Oh, and then I, I severely injured myself moving. Um, yeah, I kind of bowed out early from you moving thing. I felt bad. That no, it's not, bad. it's not your fault. Like, I just... I stress out my muscles, and sometimes if I stress out my lower back muscles too much, it pinches my sciatic nerve, and it becomes excruciatingly painful to do anything yeah that's so a, that's a i couldn't move for like three days and it was awful um Once again, satan. yeah definitely so yeah i mean the moral <laughs> of the story is satan. all of these things are because of satan so and i need if to you just, just submitted i know totally your all of your decision making yeah all right let so, jesus make my decisions yeah, well, anyways that's why we're so behind um uh, ricky scoogs and crazy. ricky scoogs beebs um hang on i gotta I, there was a fourth guy i forgot what his name was but they all have like Fred a double or something yeah, they have like a double letter in there somewhere scoogs and crazy and i don't know boo boo and i uh, fucking boo boo yeah <laughs> yeah they, i mean some there's david dibs oh yeah dibs double b uh, double o and double e is the thing oh yeah you're right yeah yeah, yeah that's the convention and double t for everett i believe yeah that's what the fuck? I never even noticed that. That's so weird. That's like his naming convention for rockers, I guess. I, I will say that I I don't fully believe Creston Mapes is a real name because that just sounds it like something be. like you get like pulled over by the police or something. And they're like, what's your name, son? You go, uh, Creston. In May. Yeah, like, yeah, like like when Homer changes his name to Max Power from yeah, the side of the really fucking That's really what that shit sounds like. Hair dryer. Um yeah, I don't know. I was just trying trying to find more ridiculous names, but I'm having trouble. Um the, uh, Andorra Crystal is right Yeah, there. it's very Oh, yeah, oh god, we should talk about the song titles. Oh yeah, uh I only remember really one of them, yep. which is Incinerator with S I N in the middle there in all caps. Cap- yeah, all yep. caps. Just so you really so you really get it. Like they they, <laughs> they really wanted you to like I, I he should have just um, bolded in and italicized and underlined that those three letters too because he like really want you it's like in sin, man. Like you get it in sin. The whole attitude of this book is like that. Yeah, you get it right. Yeah. Oh yeah, and then his and then his uh, his ex girlfriend's name was Liza Moon. Uh, who she was like died. an actress of, that died oh, of wait, cancer. Wait, 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 wait! No, 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 no! Hang on, hang on. She was an actress that no, died. No, she of... didn't die of cancer. She died from doing coke somehow. What? <laughs> like, it no, makes but it was no... like a slow death. Like she didn't no. like OD. No, she did. Hang on, it makes no fucking sense. No, she was like in a bed, like in. She was on her deathbed. Uh, you don't OD on a deathbed. Like, you, you die right there on the she floor. She overdosed, said Liza's sister, staring at her sibling's ashen face, closed eyes, and cracked lips. Yeah, she, if you overdose, she you overdosed. die right there. You don't, like, lay, you don't deteriorate over time. Uh, yeah, I don't know. It well, maybe... sounded like she had, can't, like, she was, like, no, thin she and wafy or some shit. Like, that's what I remember happening. Um... So she overdosed, but like the whole she wrote it out for a bit. She hung on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I have to. I have to find the. They gave her like half of an epipen. <laughs> um. No, I need to find the fucking. Uh, there's like, there's an explanation where he talks about um. How they met and how uh she had gotten up. She basically like she was normal until she won like a Golden Globe, and then she was like. I'm amazing and did a bunch of coke and like yeah, killed like, herself. Yeah. I don't know. It did, doesn't did make a rail sense. off the Golden Globe in backstage after she got. She's like, well, I'm here now. I can do whatever. Or yeah, something. it was like she got an award and it went to her head, and then she just like because, went on an you know ego why, trip. Paris? Because all women are innocent to begin with, and then something oh. corrupts them. Oh no, Chris, that sounds pretty bad. That's that's the attitude towards know. a lot of things over here. There's also like. um fucking uh everett's nephew or something who oh, like yeah. hates him and like I, he was like really into him at one point but then decided he hates no it was the it was like the was it his nephew it, or it was the dad of the girl that got put into a coma from his mike's incident like really hated him but then also 
his nephew hated him because someone else got in a car accident or something. Yeah, so basically his nephew's Brother. Liked his nephew. His other nephew got into a car accident, I think, was the thing. Yeah, so his nephews l- always liked him and his music, but he never had time for them. So even though they liked his music, they grew to resent him because he was never, like, there to hang out with them, which, like, who gives a shit? Who resents their uncle for not spending time with them? Yeah, anyway. that's, like, a dad thing, not, yeah, like, your, like, relative who, like, has the, their own shit going on. Yeah, too. it doesn't really make any sense. But anyway... One of the kids gets into a car accident and fucking dies. And then the other kid hates Everett forever because the kid, when he was driving the car, was like blasting a Deathstroke song and said, We're all free, man. Yeah, Let's like, do whatever we want. Let's drive right into the yeah. hay bale. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's, <laughs> like, I mean, that's really what. That's what, basically how it was described. That's, that's what happened. Like, yeah. They were like. Is that what this dude thinks like the influence of rock music is yes, like? Where mm-hmm. you're just like, I could do whatever. I could. I'm invincible, literally. Yes. Yes. Like, that's such an over-the-top interpretation. Like, if he had been like, oh, you know, like the, the influence of it over time, he got more into drugs, and, like, he was high that one time, and he just wasn't paying attention. But it's a very direct, like, nah, man, Everett's telling me to drive off this yeah, fucking they were, cliff, bro. <laughs> yeah, they were listening to a Deathstroke song, and that inspired them to drive recklessly and believe they were invincible. So, yeah, I mean, and, and honestly, as two metal musicians ourselves it's pretty ridiculous to read something like this because we live in that world and it's nothing like this i mean it first of all nothing like, to do with this. i mean if it's he's really like a heavy metal band like let's let's go yeah. with the conceit that they're a metal band sure. right first of all even they're though, not making no. they're gonna be making that much fucking money no there's not gonna be that many fans i guess if they're like metallica you, yeah that's like but you have to be literally metallica so yeah i, guess, I maybe that's what they were trying to get i at. guess so like yeah fine let's assume they're metallica or something but even then yeah, yeah. freedom <laughs> yeah freedom, freedom. <laughs> I can't. a very country metallica <laughs> yeah <laughs> like if you just mentioned a truck in there somewhere <laughs> oh no but like you wouldn't, <laughs> you wouldn't take off that quickly either because in in the eighties, early nineties, it's not like Metallica was that popular yet. It took well, them a, again, this it took them a little while to get up to the steam. Oh well, yeah, and this they're is... like instantly popular is the thing. Yeah, like they get signed at fifteen, and it's like all over from there. Like they're fucking incredibly. Wealthy so there's never and... any run up, even at, like there's not even like a couple of fucking garage shows. I think there's like maybe a week or two of those, and then all of a sudden. Oh, they said they toured Ohio when they were teenagers. When they were fifteen, I'm like, what fifteen year old tours Ohio? Who's driving you? Like your mom's just all fucking. Maybe fun. one of them was sixteen and could drive. I don't know. What's the Ohio drive? I mean, it's Ohio. They probably have child marriage there. Like who knows? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, what actually, else, well, whatever's going on over no, there. No, the United lot. States does have child marriage. It's fucked up. Yeah, I know. Like, if you get permission but, from the parents, apparently you can just do whatever. But some states, it's the the age is like really low. Yeah, that's why I was I was saying. Must but be Ohio. but like I said, there's no transitionary period of them like actually playing a bunch of shitty shows. No, or... they played around Ohio for like a couple months or something, and then, and then instantly they got it up. all takes off from there. Like that's not how a fan be like. Say what you will about payola and music marketing and like that yeah. whole inside boys club kind of a thing. But it does not just happen that quickly, especially for a heavy metal band. Well, again, I mean, this was like the 70s when they were first signed. So like I said, it it makes a little more sense if you think about it that way. Obviously, today, things are very different. That kind of shit does not happen. And also, but... like, w- portraying like every single rock band. I mean, this is just one rock band, so I can't. This is kind of a little bit unfair. But the idea that every rock band is just a party fucking rocker super drugs oriented thing is like yeah also like it's really hard to be that intense about partying and maintain a successful band because it takes a lot of management skills and like being on time to shit and yeah and like everybody responsibility and right and i mean everybody that does i mean like i know plenty of musicians that do drugs and plenty that don't and the ones that go off the deep end you just never hear about them again i mean yeah they're in like shitty bands that play shitty diy shows all the time and that's about it because they can they can only get their shit together like once every two or three months yeah i mean and and don't get me wrong like obviously if you have if you're a band and you have a lot of money like you're in a successful band then it's a little easier to do a bunch of drugs and be sure. irresponsible because you have other people managing shit for you yeah. but like if you're at a lower level yeah it's it's pretty difficult to be a total mess all the time and also run yeah. that shit well i think that's why people end up doing so many uppers like coke is because they have to be it requires just a lot of time investment don't and get me wrong there's plenty of like heroin use and drug 
abusing types even in like the niche of heavy metal that I'm in. Like the faceless has been like missing a bunch of shows lately and everyone's pretty sure it's because Michael Keen got on that H. Oh no. Um, like they straight up canceled whole entire tours oh. over like missing a flight three times. Oh yeah. I saw the thing where they missed flights a million times. And yeah. You showed me there's, that. There's a uh, Blake Judd and knock missed him except he's apparently like clean and like trying to get better now, but he like basically I, stole merch money from people. He fucked a lot of people over and everybody. So it, that's not unheard of. I'm not oh saying... yeah. No, but, but like also, at least where we live in here in Massachusetts, the heroin epidemic reaches everyone. It's not like oh the seedy metal and rock group. No, it it's 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 that everyone. fucking cheerleader. It's that guy at Dunkin' Donuts. It is your high school teacher. It is ev- it's so many people. Like it's crazy. There is a problem. Like heroin and opiates are a huge problem here. And um, I guess we're getting a little off topic, but. Yeah. Just the, making point the point we're getting that, like, at it's, it's, yeah. it's just such a cliche, shallow yeah. representation and understanding of how any musician's life looks. And it's not accurate. Like, OK, so let's. All right. Just my band alone. Like we have. Uh, I'm a nonprofit manager. We have an accountant. Uh, we have a pharmaceutical doctor, uh, guy that works in a clean room at elect- uh, like to make electronics like and somebody who's another nonprofit manager. Like we all have very like normal jobs like we're all pretty yeah. successful and we, my band has know... like a sales consultant who makes like <laughs> nearly six figures i have a, a wendy's manager who like is at work all the time like is the most on time for shit i know I it, so- it sounds like oh wendy's no this kid is fucking legit i'm yeah. not like I'm reggie sure is he's the running man a wendy's like on his own all the time and shit i've got um a combination like yoga instructor slash personal fitness trainer slash mm-hmm. medical device manufacturer Slash a bunch of other shit because that dude has like 50 million projects he's always working on all the time. And then there's uh, the guy that basically runs a a shitload of diners. My second guitar player like is like the guy that sets up and does like the early morning stuff for like multiple diners in the area. Yeah, I mean, I guess the point we're trying to make is I know this is anecdotal, but it's just like in both of our experiences, we don't. Like, we don't have to deal with anybody that's, like, strung out on drugs all the time. I mean, we did have that one guy in the Boston scene that disappeared uh, after he stole money from the one fund. I don't know. I don't think you ever knew him. Uh, um, yeah, no, but like, let's not be naming names and shit here. Just but. Oh, no, fuck that guy. I don't care. He very obviously stole thousands of dollars from a charity show. And uh, basically, once everybody found out about it, he moved away and, like, disappeared. And I, I don't know if he exists anywhere anymore. But yeah. uh, I think it's just a fundamental guy, misunderstanding you know, of, like... I mean, this was 2005, so it's different. Yeah. But the the average musician nowadays is just like someone with a day job that has this yeah. this hobby mm-hmm. that they put a lot of their time and creative energy into. And there's like you know, there's so much music out there now, and it's such a cool thing. It's hard to sift through a bunch of like the sort of mediocre stuff to find the real gems, but it's so rewarding when you find like this one guy that like has a couple of thousand views on his YouTube channel. Even, like, really well-known bands in my particular niche have, like, oh, 40,000 views on YouTube or something like that. Mm-hmm. So it, it's... It, a, a lot of musicians are just average working people. That yeah, don't they're, have yeah the, they're like, pretty normal. It's not like... We're not all in this to just party all the time. Yeah. And, you know, it's all not all sex... Maybe that's, like, the initial thing. Yes, when you are young, to be like, oh, it's a cool thing to get into because of all this fun stuff that might happen. Yeah, But once sure. you get into it, once you're actually writing decent music, I think, you've gotten to a level where you appreciate the craft of things more than... I can't speak for everyone, of course, but... Yeah. I mean, and, like, neither of us have obvi- obviously have never been on quite the level of uh, this Deathstroke yeah. band. So... So, you know, it, it could be a different world entirely up there for sure. Yeah. But, but I mean, we're again, we're assuming we're going with the heavy metal conceit that the author put in here. Yeah. I don't taking know him if... at his word over here. Oh, sorry. Back to I found the paragraph about Liza Moon. Yeah. Hit me. Um, after the Oscar for her lead role in the hit film Bed of Morning, she changed. How could she not? Stardom throws your ego into overdrive and takes over your system. Stardom ruins people. Your head feels with, fills with helium and your pride carries you away. Liza, who formerly never touched drugs or alcohol, became a free basing cocaine queen. <laughs> Everyone in the industry, including me, watched her fall. Her appearance and personality were never the same once she started the habit. The whites of her shining eyes turned to red and her beautiful personality shriveled. She began using tons of makeup to cover the dark circles beneath her eyes. She became sickeningly skinny due to anorexia. Okay. I'm pretty sure Maybe anorexia that's why and coke I thought don't... there was like some cancer stuff happening. I like yeah. misremembered what was going on. Yeah. But again, like so... she did, the, the overdose death is like a very slow OD. 
Yeah, it's Cause, pretty Because I think slow. Edward has, like, time to fly over yep. to her. Yeah, he has time to fly there and be like, <laughs> goodbye, lady I love. Go through loved. the security yeah. in line, yep. get checked, you know, pack all the stuff, wait for, like, uh, the flight delay to happen, the connection in Newark that got delayed. No, no. It, what do you... Or what, Chris, I'm, I'm Chris. adding shitty... <laughs> no, you're an idiot. You know why? Why? He has a private death stroke clean. He doesn't have to go through security. He doesn't oh, have to true. fucking yeah. wait for anything. Excuse he can just me. fly anywhere on command. But it was still, like, across the country. Yeah, like, I know. Like, an OD is not going to, like, sustain that long yeah i i don't know um i mean i'm not a medical doctor perhaps there's a version of an overdose where you can like overdose and come back a little bit and then still die like that seems reasonable to me i don't know maybe yeah sure but it it's uh, it i know it's right. not it's not the ods that we see literally every day where we live you know it, I, yeah i don't get that yeah so um we haven't what oh, I never, I never told you about how Satan was incompetent. We kind of covered it a little bit. No, but so continue. Let's and, oh go back God, we're so we're always, bad. We're always meandering. I know. On this thing, man. Like Sorry, the, guys. If you've been listening to us long enough, you know how we is. So. How, yeah, it's like a terrible, terrible board game. Um, so Satan's incompetence. So Karen, that's right. I started describing Karen, and then we got carried away about evangelical Christianity. So anyway, he meets up with Karen finally all these years later, and of course they fall in love immediately. Da da. Um, and so, so there's this character called Zane Zany. Bender. Please, Zany. And they call him Zany. He's basically a and clown. He's, yeah, and he's, he's like bald and pale, but he has like weirdly like overly red lips or something like that. And he talks in a high squeaky voice. Yeah, it's really weird. So, so he's like this big fat squeaky guy. Yeah, that he's... chases them around in a truck half the time. He meets Everett in like jail while Everett's in like you know in holding during his trial. Yeah. Or... Or something like that before he gets out on bail. Mm -hmm. And he's like, I'm going to get you, Everett. Like, like some yeah. Mickey Mouse shit. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it said that he has a high pitched voice. So that's all I they can imagine. They really <laughs> emphasize the squeakiness. Like, they really, yeah. he really talks about, like, how squeaky he is. I'm going to get you, man. Yeah, it's Satan's <laughs> coming for you, buddy. It's so weird. And so this is the guy who tries to kill them constantly, but does a really bad job of it. Like, Okay, don't you think if you had Satan's help, you could manage to burn down a house and kill someone in it or, like, hit them with a car or he anything? He misses them with a truck on, like, three separate occasions. Yeah, yeah. With, like, so, the same truck, I'm Well, the sure. first thing that happens is Karen's house burns down. And then we're going to talk about the whole... I, I'm the whole how she gets like a new house immediately thing. Um, yeah, she like it like, again, this is how it all works out for yeah. you if you accept Jesus. Like. So Karen is at home one night and... Uh, she lives on her own. She has her own house. She has like a decently pay, high paying job somewhere. Yeah, She's I a forget. business lady. She's a business lady. Some kind of business lady. Anyway, so he ever calls her one night in the middle of the night because he just gets a feeling. Yeah. And he calls her a feeling in his dick probably. <laughs> yeah. And he calls her and... Um, I got a little hard so I figured I yeah, would call I you to I'd assuage call you. The... Yeah, I figured I'd call you so you could read some Bible verses to me yeah. so my heart on goes away. Um, anyway... <laughs> Uh, so he calls her in the middle of the night for some, you know, fucking unknown reason. And she's like, oh, hello. And then while she's on the phone with him, she's like, oh, no, my house is burning down. Yeah, like he like, happened what? to call her. So toasty in here. Yeah. So basically, I think the whole the whole idea is like, oh, God nudged you to call her so she would wake up and not die from the fire. But like she I mean, she has fire alarms in her house. Like. Yeah. Hello. So unless like Zany also removed all the batteries while he was well, in Well, that would be smart, but I don't think he did that. So it's kind of big, you know, hard to yeah. sneak around. So anyway, he burns her house down, but she gets out because uh Everett was on the phone with her, she was awake at the time. Also, like what if and, he was um, there to burn the house down, assuming he wasn't like too far away, you could get her while she's leaving, right? Yeah, well that that's the thing. So yeah, so the guy starts the fire and then leaves yeah he's just like ah, that's enough I gotta get <laughs> yeah like he doesn't even stick around to make sure it works so she escapes and survives and then on another occasion uh when he goes to actually physically meet her um or was this no the burning house was first yeah then that was like, the that was like before he met her right i think they no, they'd met a, like, he'd seen her know. in passing a couple of times so anyway he burns her house down and then a while later, uh, Everett goes to visit her and they're standing on the street, like hugging. And because that's, that's all you're allowed to do. Yes, that's all Leave they're allowed room to for do. the Holy Spirit. And this truck just comes barreling down the road and tries to run them over. And they, uh, I don't know, they tuck and roll away yeah, they just or something. Run away. 
And then and like the truck doesn't I really chase them again. Like it just kind of. And fucks then the truck off. like it tries hit them again. Comes but then, back like later, like a, like it's like a week later or like a couple of so, days later. So no, no, like it. So it tries to hit them the first time, fails, and then tries again and fails. But then I don't remember what happens. I don't remember like why doesn't he just keep trying to kill them? Oh, maybe they no, get in the car and drive I th- away. They might drive away a little, but like it. it I don't he, know. It, he could have continued chasing them. Yeah. I just remember like the tension immediately being released yeah, in a way. It's like yeah. wait. Why didn't he he like the 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 clown dude just always tries once and he's like ah, I'm too tired man uh, yeah like <laughs> so so he tries to run them over fails and then that situation just stops and then yeah like Chris was saying a couple weeks later they're hanging out with Karen's family so Everett is with his family and members of her family and they're all in a jeep they're going to see Christmas lights somewhere it, it, like if you're from around here everett's you've family seen got interlaced with the family of the girl who got into a coma because everett's brother oh uh, yeah hooks up with the uh no his sister mary yeah, yeah, his sister. hooks up with the uncle of the girl that he put in a coma yeah yeah yes. that, that's how it works mary out. and jerry yeah Ugh. Ugh. Yeah. And they're so all, of course they're all super christianned up because yeah. you know mm-hmm. you find love after G- via, Christ- <laughs> via Christianity, yeah. <laughs> so anyway, so they're all together and they're going to see this like um Christmas light show like I was saying if you live around if you live in Massachusetts, if you've ever been to La Salette Shrine where they do like these big Christmas light displays and you like drive around or walk around and like look at it. I don't know. My parents dragged me as a kid. So, I guess it was kind of like that. So they're just like driving through this thing and this car is tailgating them and then it just tries to drive them into a lake. Like push it drive. tries to push their Jeep into a lake or their car or SUV, whatever it is. Yeah. And it almost works, but then it doesn't because of some like, I don't know, fucking I think the, Canyon Arrow uh, driving. Yeah, like, had, like some kind of cool driving maneuver or something like that. Yeah, they did something and then... <sighs> That so that also fails, and, and then, then he just like drives the, the uh, zany just drives away. It's like yeah. assumed to be zany. I don't think they ever like get a clear picture. It, it's him, definitely, yeah, but it's definitely him. And so that happens, and that doesn't work. And then there are also moments when Zane's in prison with Everett during the present time, where he like beats him up but never kills him. Yeah, he's like, "I'm gonna and kill then, you," and he fucks him up, and then he leaves, and then he doesn't kill him. And then, yeah, and then later on... um, This author doesn't know how to, like, resolve a dramatic situation no. without someone just walking away and deciding, like, ah, it's enough for today. Because he wants to maintain the tension of those characters being in conflict with each other, but he doesn't know how to resolve each yeah. individual scene. Yeah, And so, uh, eventually... So there's, like, I don't know, five instances of failure, and then at the end, he kidnaps Karen. They never explain how he kidnaps her. Like, remember, it's just like, oh, she was kidnapped. And everyone's like, yeah, what? She went to the call. bathroom. She went to the bathroom at a restaurant and got kidnapped. Like, yeah. how do you kidnap do you a lady s- out of a 99? Like, how does what a fat fuck? guy sneaking through a bathroom window or something, like, assuming that was his exit plan, because he didn't just drag her out of the bathroom out the back or some well, shit. Well, yeah, like, out the front of the bathroom. So it's a mystery as to how she was kidnapped. It doesn't really make any sense because they're, like, at a 99 or an Applebee's or well, something. Well, Satan and Santa are fairly close, so I bet he has some, like, squeezing properties, like Santa gets down to no, the chimney <laughs> no i don't think so 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 anyway like she goes they're at like some shitty fucking chain restaurant she goes to the bathroom and never comes back so that means he either walked into the woman's bathroom and dragged her out the front or dragged and her no out one said shit yeah or, or dragged her or out made a, a sound like, dragged her out a window or they went through the toilet like i don't <laughs> know like what happened she just grabbed her butt from under so, the toilet yeah, so there's took her into the sewer there's pipes. literally no explanation as to like how that makes any fucking sense because most restaurants don't even have windows in the bathroom so yeah. like how the fuck did there's that usually only one way in yeah one way out i know and so that doesn't make any sense. But anyway, he kidnaps her from like a nine, pub 99 bathroom. Just waiting and wait. And then he I was he having a real her. chicken wrap over here and he like just happened to look over and there she was. Yeah. I figured. Yeah. And then and then he has her for like a week or something. Right. Like several days at least. He's, and is he, he trying to get like Everett over to him or something. Everett's in in a trial. He yeah. can't <laughs> get to him. Like yeah. he's literally in prison. Yeah. So so it doesn't make sense. So he drives around with Karen in his camper. They describe it as a camper 
but yet when the conflict happens, it's clearly a truck. So like, I will I, say that like ah. I will confess that I didn't read this part of the book because eventually I just couldn't take the fucking book anymore, and I kind of like <laughs> hit my deadline for having to give it to you, and I was like, just fucking take it and just tell me what happens. Oh, this is the first book that I actually didn't get all the way through. I don't think that's true. No, I read all the other ones. Really? Yeah, I went all the way through everything. This is my like I consider this a personal failure in some oh, ways. Oh, that's fine. But continue with what happened after they camp yeah, out. Yeah, so so he kidnaps her in his quote camper, like a green camper or something. Even though, like I said later on, it's it seems like it's just a truck. So I don't know what that word's Satan's supposed to mean. Satan's metamorphical powers. So he has her for days, and they're just like driving around Florida because the trial is taking place in. Florida and they're staying and everyone's staying at Everett's fancy Florida She's house. Really like tie- is she tied up or anything? So that's the question. Like, I don't think, so. I mean, not that she's, she doesn't really sound like the kind of character that's going to like fight back or anything, but she, he was like at one point, you know, once they rescue her or whatever, he's like, Oh, Karen, I know you must've been through some stuff. And she, she cries. And then she goes, yeah, when he was asleep at night, I had to hear the, the most awful night terrors. And it's like, that's the worst thing that happened. He didn't like cut a limb off. He didn't try to assault you. Like, no, you just had to sleep through his night terrors. Like, and then the way he tries to kill her, which she of course gets rescued from is hilarious. So they're in Florida. So you know what he does? He takes her to the Everglades ties her to a pole and hopes that alligators eat her <laughs> like very what? haphazard yeah, like, like one step okay murder plot. like this like, doesn't, doesn't even make sense <laughs> like is he so tired that he has to go home all the time yeah, to get his like diabetes medication I don't know. It doesn't... is he just is satan just that lazy or he has to keep track of so much shit like listen like you try <laughs> keeping track of all this shit i have other people to tie to posts in other everglades yeah i know like <laughs> Yeah, that's all I can think of is Satan. I can only is possess too busy. one person at a time, okay? Yeah, it's hard. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, so Satan is just really incompetent, or at least Zany Bender is really incompetent. As Satan's agent is like extremely. Oh, he should have been fired years ago. Does he even like tie some meat to the post? Like, no. Because I don't and, think and alligators mention, just naturally go for people. No, it, like most animals, they're not going to just spontaneously try to eat you like that's not how that works and he also tied her like part of a dock and just with a piece of rope like she probably could have found a rock and like sawed it apart like i don't know um but anyway they find her even though i don't know how they find her really um god gps yeah god god ps it was like it was like they knew the area positioning system cps um oh wait no no no. i remember they they question zany because he gets kidnapped at some point and they question him and he's like i killed her and they're like they're like okay but no really he smells like the swamp i know where yeah and he's like i tied her up at i don't know i tied her up in this park and so he tells them where to look again like why 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 would you do that (laughs) So he tells them where to look and like like even if the alligators didn't get there at least you could have like starved her out or something yeah like. oh and then and then when they arrive because uh, Everett is like I just have a feeling she's like go this way Jerry and Jerry's like all right man and they just like go off the road because he has a feeling you know a God CPS Christian positioning system maybe it's just that um, boner again like yeah the he, boner like, direction he has, directional like, he, her pheromones are strong enough that if he just detects them like he gets a half chub and like, yeah. the stronger it goes. <laughs> So they get there, and of course, it, well, it was nighttime, and so they get out. Uh, he's like running through the water, you know, through the swamp because he he's trying to figure out if she's over here. Are the gators he sees, even like, there? <laughs> well, that that's the point I'm getting to. He sees the dilapidated dock, and he's like, he sees all these eyes staring at him because there's just alligators fucking everywhere. <laughs> like I don't think they're herd animals, right? Yeah, yeah. right. Sure. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I know the Everglades has a lot of. You know, alligators. I wildlife, think they're but... fairly solitary. I don't think they do social groups that much. Um, I don't know. I've seen maybe my, um, that's a completely out of my ass, but I don't think I've ever seen a video of like a bunch. Well, I've seen rivers full of alligators. That's not true. Yeah, but they're not like chilling and cooperating, right? They're just yeah. kind of like existing near one another. But anyway, it was totally and the, absurd. But of course, the alligators were like just waiting for the dramatic moment or something. Like, yeah. okay, we're gonna wait until Everett shows up. Yeah, so, like it's the, then we're the gonna meat is tastier if <laughs> they were. It's like they're not. They're not anyway. Um, oh yeah, and then we're gonna talk about the trial and how. Oh excuse me. So the trial. Yeah, actually, we're, we've been talking for quite a while already. Like this is one oh, of the man. first books that we've had a, quite a bit of material to cover. Oh man. All right. So sorry for the really long episode, guys. I'm sure they're fine with it. 
So uh, the trial is happening. You know, the whole book flashes back and forth between present day trial and like Chris was saying, the past instances that they're talking about at the trial. But um, actually, I, I do want to talk about some stuff that I do like about this book. One, I thought that the format it was written in was pretty good. Like the way that he handled the flashbacks was fine. It was pretty, it was clear sure. when he was switching back and forth. There were no grammatical or spelling errors. Yeah. That oh, was funny. Like it was for the most part. That was great. At least Thank you. Had a good editor. Well, he is an editor. Oh, that's true. He's a journalist, copywriter, and editor. Um, and I, I mean, many other people we've read have claimed to be editors too, and they fucking weren't. So, yeah. Mr. Mapes, I applaud you for making this at least readable. I mean, see, we're, we're I don't agree with you on any way, but you know, your writing was uh, we're okay. Willing to... I mean, I think that his his dialogue was incredibly cheesy and awful and fucking yeah, like there's, there's almost no like white bread Midwestern shit. But um, at least it was. It was written in a way that made sense and the punctuation, you know, formatting, spelling was all good. I did not find a single error, which was impressive. So like, that's why I didn't have as much of trouble reading it as you did. Like, I can tolerate things a lot more if the framework is there and you just can't tolerate it if the content is bad. Yeah, it, it got to a certain point where the, the, like I said, the cliche nature of everything just me, I couldn't stomach it. Yeah. It's a shallow understanding of, like, nearly every aspect of life, not just the musician thing, though. It, it's also about... Yeah, you like... You trials work. Like, let's get on the trial thing. Oh, yeah. Like, wait, wait, Should we talk about Karen Bayless's burned-down house and her new house? Sure, for a so, second before you get to the trial. So, Karen, when her house burns down... So, again, this is, like, a house she bought. She's single, works. I mean, it's Topeka, Kansas in 2005. I mean, eh. Or 2004 or something. Like, it's, you know probably wasn't insanely expensive but still like wages are lower there so she's doing pretty well her house burns down she immediately finds another house like she's only staying at like a motel for like she's staying with her parents and then she's staying at a motel for like two or three weeks until the signing happens on her new house like that she found really have, fucking quickly how do you just have a spare house of money like hanging yeah. around just like Oh, this is my spare house money for if my house burns down. She had a good job, but it weren't that fucking good. And I mean, I know that obviously, like, if your house gets burned down in arson and you have insurance, like, you probably get insurance payout or whatever. But I don't think you get it that quickly. Not in two weeks, Do for you? sure. Hell no, I don't not think in two so. Weeks. So, yeah. So she was already, she already was signing for a new house, like, three weeks after the fire and had already found a new house, like, a week after the fire. So that was pretty ridiculous. And she basically just acted like it was no big deal and... Um, yeah, has this guy ever bought a house before? Yeah, I don't think he no. even like talks anything about mortgage details. Or, no, like, no, none it's of just, that. Just I have this house now. Yeah, and you know, of course, it was like conveniently. In Not the that I need like a bunch of pages about like Karen working out the fucking kinks on. No, no, but yeah, it's a very it's a very unrealistic fantasy world, basically, and um, and then another thing that's super unrealistic is you know the trial. So the trial happens. No and... legal person in this trial seems competent at all in any like the judge like seems to just Ju grant objective uh, objections and yeah randomly I can never I can never get a clear view of like what side the judge was like. So the judge is Judge Sprocket, which made me laugh. Yeah. I don't know why, but Judge Sprocket is funny. And then there was Boone, who was Everett's attorney, and. Whoever Foghorn Leghorns, whatever. Super Texas y guy. What was his name? Uh, he, I, I forget, but he like had a cowboy hat on. Yeah. And I believe there was even a little bit of like, I say, like. He had a cowboy hat on? I th yes, I'm pretty sure there was a cowboy hat on at remember. the start. But anyway, so we're just going to call him Foghorn Leghorn. Yeah. Um, so basically, Foghorn is creating a pretty solid case that Everett Lester is like unhinged, heavily, in, you know, heavily into drugs and alcohol and like is unpredictable. Uh, loves firearms, ha has engaged in violent behavior. It's making a very good case that he murdered Endora Crystal in cold blood, you know. Um, and he he also had this other angle where he was trying to say that Endora was like Everett's lover, but nobody really bought that because it a it wasn't true, and b like it was pretty ridiculous. Like, yeah, I don't. The, also, I like mean, the whole like supernatural angle that happens. Mm. Where... So during the trial, they actually bring up supernatural shit and evidence because obviously the defense is trying to prove that this was a supernatural thing and that Everett isn't at fault. So at first, but then they kind of go with the hypnosis angle, which is like a little bit more plausible. Yeah, but then there's there's the part where they talk about Endora pushing a gun out of 
ever its hand like into the ocean. Like telekinetically, like yeah. throwing a gun into the ocean or something. Yeah. Some witness, claim, their old tour manager. Yeah, it's like, it's that. just eyewitness shit. Like, you're not gonna fuck. Yeah. That's yeah, not enough then... to, like, convince a courtroom of people of, like, supernatural events, I think. Yeah, I don't think so. And so then they go the hypnosis angle, because that is, at you know, in the world of this book, that is what happened. She hypnotized Everett. Um, and there was another incident before where she had hypnotized him to smash a guitar against, like, a rock fountain wall in a recording studio. Because you have rock fountain walls, I guess, in recording studios. Yeah, that's no, none that I've ever been let's in. Bring that but, up. Like you know. uh, having like just running cascading water anywhere near all that gear. Yeah. Even if it's like two rooms away, fuck that. I know. I think it was like in the lobby, but I don't. I don't remember. Or no, it couldn't have been because he had an instrument. I don't know. Yeah, and like there's not like mm. most studios don't have like multiple levels to them. Yeah, I mean, I guess the idea was like this is a fucking big ass studio, but it doesn't make any sense. Anyway, so she had hypnotized him in the past to see, just to see if it would work. And what she did was she made him destroy this really nice guitar on a fountain wall and it destroyed the fountain and whatever. Um, and then he like woke up on the floor and was like, what the fuck happened? And everyone was like, dude, did you just black out? And he was like, I don't know, I guess. They were like, you don't remember doing that? And he was like, no. And, but nobody at the time, nobody thought it was hypnosis, obviously. They just thought that he blacked out like he did on stage when he threw that mic stand and put that girl in a coma. So, I mean, honestly, the prosecution had a really good case. Yeah. Like, except for the weird romance angle, like, it didn't really make a whole lot of sense as to why he would shoot his trusted advisor, but people did say that they fought a lot. Like, they got a lot of people to say, like, oh, yeah, they bickered all the time. Yeah, and, and there was witnesses saying that Everett likes his guns and that he makes mm -hmm. some kind of, like, threatening statements sometimes. Yep. He made threatening statements towards Endora, and people had said that, oh, they they had been fighting, and, and uh, Endora was always try trying to control him so that, like, conceivably, he could have shot her because he was mad about her trying to control him. So, like, it may all made a lot of sense, but somehow, somehow, the jury found him not guilty. And you know why the jury found him not guilty? Why? Because the black guy that they talk about all the time, the black guy, the black guy, the black guy on the jury that kept looking at Everett Lester every day was Christian. And so, he, every day he was, like, staring at Everett, and so, of course, every day of the trial... You have the author just talking about the black guy, and it's like, oh, I th yeah, we already they, they talked about that. kind of try to play it menacing at first. I think, I think that's like yeah, the twist. Yeah, it's like, supposed to be a twist. Like he's he's glaring. The non-white one is looking at me a lot. Oh no, yeah, that's yeah. Satan. Like, yeah, and then at the end, like after the verdict gets pronounced, the juror, um, like tries to walk up to him afterward, and he could see the little a, a ring that he had on that had like a um, excuse me, a uh cross on it and the guy goes i saw jesus in you and like that's that's the only explanation they give as to why the, the jury pronounced day, him not guilty. in the back alley yeah I saw jesus all up inside you. yeah i know like i it just doesn't make sense because you have a 12 person jury even if one person is really really for you I mean, it doesn't mean that they're going to convince everybody else, especially in a case like that. I, I, isn't that the thing about like a hung jury? Like if one person's a holdout, they have to like keep talking it out or something for unanimous. Verdict. Yeah, but but the at the same time, like you're not going to convince 11 other people. Yeah, that this guy really got possessed by fucking hypnosis, Satan. And... Because you felt it. Yeah, I know. I mean, well, how does that convince? Like, I can't imagine maybe like two or three. Of the yeah, jurors. a few well, people. Even five. But, like, I mean, unless they were all like. Unless the whole jury was super Christian and believed in his born again Christianity. Well, but wasn't the impression given that they were like all about to put him away and then all the one guy was like, no, but I felt Jesus. Yeah. And then, oh, so here's another thing that I'm confused about. So this whole book talks about how Satan is like really real and evil is real. So do people who believe in that brand of Christianity like actually believe in supernatural like shit like that? Like mm -hmm. guns flying via telekinesis and stuff? I guess they must because Partic they think D and D is evil. So yeah, in this particular subset of mm. Christianity, for sure, yeah, yeah, I would say yes, indeed. Because if you're already believing in omnipotent beings, it's not much of a stretch to yeah. think that you know some other stuff like that could happen as well. Yeah, okay. Because you know, through God, all things are possible. Yeah, I guess. Um, yeah, and by the way, when you get um, when you get found, you know, not guilty of murder, you get to just walk out of the courtroom. No processing. You just walk out and get into a car and drive away. Because that's what happened in the book, and I'm 
I'm almost 100% certain that that is not the, how The one goes. thing I remember about the trial is, like, honestly, like, the judge, like, what his criteria for granting an objection or Yeah, not, no one knows. It seemed to just wildly differ depending on, like, what would be more interesting to write at the time. Yeah, it was weird because sometimes he would, he wouldn't let them talk about his, like, his past and sometimes they he would. And and the and, supernatural thing, he was like, don't bring that malarkey in here. And then he's like, I want to hear more. Yeah, and, the, it, yeah, it's, like, it's integral to the defense. So, like, they have to talk about it. Like, fuck you, judge. It just, yeah, it didn't make any sense. Um, so, yeah, of course, in the end, everything's great. And they rescue Karen. He gets found not guilty of the murder. And he, you know, wears a sweater vest. And, uh, I don't know, they they get married. So Do they, they get married? I don't know. I, yeah, I'm pretty sure they get married. Yeah, because I remember thumbing through the, the closing interview. Dude, there's a sequel. Yeah, no, this this is a book series. Yeah, I can't imagine what like what else happens. Like, I, oh, if I you're started, fully converted, then like no, no, no. I started reading the sample chapter in the back, and it's like about his nephew, the one that's doing drugs. Oh, so they go that route. They're like, uh, Wes. It's about Wes. Um, oh, okay. I guess now he has to. Con- now it's about him converting others. I mean, it must be. I forget. Does he give up the mu- the musician thing? Yeah, he said that he he might write some you know acoustic stuff. The the songs he wrote in oh, jail. Oh shit! That's right. He wrote some shit in prison. That's like mad. Oh, uh, let me see. Can you can... see if you can find yeah, the yeah, later yeah. one where he like he write, pens a song about like his conversion? Because that's even worse. Yeah, they're really bad. While you're thumbing through for that, I'm gonna like. <laughs> Again, it's not that I'm trying to shit on the idea of believing in religion in general, but this particular idea where just just accept Jesus and everything's magically going to work out for you, and the fact that they push that idea is just it's it's a bad idea to a and b. It's just bad writing too, because then yeah. there's not really any good conflicts anywhere. Let me see if I can thumb through. No it. way! I think I just found something. Oh yeah. Uh. <sighs> It's called Blind Slash Faith. <laughs> I'm going to try to... Oh, already. Already. <laughs> I led you down a dead street. I didn't care if you would die. <laughs> I took your money and I stole your heart. I pushed you out when you didn't know how to fly. <laughs> I don't know didn't how to say this. <laughs> yeah, it did. Die and fly. Okay. Uh, it was the blind leading the blind, my friend. Will you let Jesus in? It was the blind leading the blind, my friend. Will you forgive me for my sin? It was the blind leading the blind, my friend. This is your chance to be born ag- again. <laughs> don't yeah. say don't say you don't believe in him. Don't say he's just a lie. Listen to his voice. It's calling you. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Life and lie. Close. It was the blind leading the blind, my friend, blah, blah, blah. Um, yeah. yeah. So that was one. There's like other ones, though. There's a couple of more, but like it, it's just a clear, sharp turn from like freedom. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. To like Jesus. <laughs> yeah. His word. Oh God, it's so fucking bad. Like also, you can you can make Christian music without being so fucking on the nose. Yeah, guys. like Striker was cool. There's plenty of like vague, not really even like Under Oath at least kind of like had a yeah. vague fuck. Like they didn't go like his That's word true. and his thing. Like at least they tried to put some artfulness into it. Yeah, there are some Christian. I'm trying to think if there's any Christian bands that I like. Um, I like Lorena McKenna, and she's kind of even though she appeals to a lot of pagans, she definitely writes songs about God and stuff. And I don't care yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's fun not to, this, it's not like I, it's not inherently that i hate that idea of you being if you really believe in that shit and it helped you of course you're gonna write some music about it if that's your thing it's just too bad that the music also sucks is all it's we're just, saying like it doesn't have to be so fucking unsubtle yeah oh oh there's more i found the other one i found the other all right one. what's the title on this See, one See, i think if it's it, called uh release okay well at least that's kind of oh this is right at the end too um, I thought of the black man who stared at me so often throughout the trial. Of course you did. What did he see? <laughs> what was he thinking? Uh, anyway. Uh, there's a place I know so well where I am in control. There's a cozy place that never want to leave. But then you say, let's go. Let's go. Re- release yourself to the one in charge. Release yourself tonight. Release yourself. Don't look back. Everything's Blow gonna on be alright. Oh, I don't know. I'm also joke singing. This that is not does my sound act- like it's talking about. This is not my actual singing uh, voice. Uh, uh, sexual release. <laughs> uh, do you know the place I'm talking about where you call all the shots? Well, it seems pretty good from where you sit, but from where he sits, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> oh God. From my perspective, the Jedi are evil. Yeah. <laughs> Release yourself. He's waiting now. Release yourself today. Release yourself. He'll carry you along life's rugged way. Um, I'm going to rename this one uh, Blow a Load on Jesus. That's fine. 
Oh, anyway, uh, that one's also about being blind and seeing again, even uh, though he I'm already wrote a song. I'm taking personal offense to yeah. the usage of blind people in, the, in this yeah, material. Yeah, blind people. Um, oh, so at the back, um, Wait, let's, he... Yeah, let's, this, is, this is how we're wrapping. We originally wanted to wrap it up with like the other Rolling Stone interview at the end, but uh, honestly, the, phone, the photos on my phone are kind of fucked up. So That's ahead. fine. So let's just wrap up with the discussion question. Because he get, Creston Mapes is kind enough to give you some... Uh, Discussion questions for your Bible study group or perhaps like youth Christian reading group. Yep. Um, discussion questions. Number one. One reason Everett had such a strained relationship with his father was because Vince's love for Everett was based on how well he did, how good he was, etc. Have you ever felt like Everett did trying to perform to earn a parent's or a friend's love? How did that make you feel and why? Fine question. Honestly, like not overly Christian and it's a good way to get people talking about. But then. But then. Karen's letters to Everett were bold, compassionate, and spirit-filled. Has God ever led you to step out in such a way to share the gospel with someone? Did you do it? If so, explain what happened. If not, explain what hindered you. I felt real weird talking about God in the middle of the Burger King. Yeah. So. <laughs> um... I mean, I don't know. There's just a bunch of questions here. Like, it, It's that kind of thing. Where, um, like, it, it, clearly, Karen... this book was made to, like pass around some kind of youth groups in Christian churches and, you know, have people talking about the yeah, dangers of and rock like, and roll. And well, that's the thing. It's like, there's some good in here. Like there's a question that's about letting go of destructive relationships. Yeah. That's a great idea. Sure. But the way that you're supposed to let it go of it in this presented in this yeah. book is n not a very long-term healthy way to yeah. think about things. So, yeah, I think that, like, a decent intention, I think that's the thing with this brand of Christianity, like, always decent intentions, but just a complete misunderstanding yeah. of how to actually deal with these kinds of things in my book. Not That's not to say for all Christianity, there's some, again, certain sects of Christianity actually do have fairly great answers. Yeah. If you're looking for that kind of thing, but just, you know, research what you're getting into. Yeah, like, okay, the last discussion question is, Karen wrote to Everett that Satan's goal was to, quote, Kill, steal, and destroy, end quote. The Bible tells us to be on alert because, quote, your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour, end quote. What areas of your life are potential strike zones for Satan? It's good to know these areas, to discuss them, and to be on alert. Strike zones for Satan. <laughs> strike zones for Satan. That's going to be, strike zones for Satan! <laughs> my charity. Um, oh, that's my new song. Um, we uh, help <laughs> facilitate arms deals between huge nations and... <laughs> Rebel groups. Yeah. So, I mean, I... Uh, Just a painful, cringeworthy book that, yeah. off, like, seems to present the idea that the magic solution to everything is submit in total servitude to this deity. Oh, oh, right. And their shows trigger riots, by the way, guys. They're so fucking cool. Very death clocky, like I said. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, actually, you're right. It is very death clock-like. Um... So this was the the night that he threw that mic stand into the crowd and put a girl in a coma. Um, this is from the newspaper. The antics of Deathstroke's lead singer Everett Lester took their toll last night at the Dayton Arena, where 16 of the 17,682 in attendance were hospitalized after a riot broke out when Lester passed out on stage and management stopped the concert. A 14-year-old Xenia girl is in critical condition at Good Samaritan Hospital. She was struck in the head by a microphone stand, allegedly tossed from the stage by Lester, who witnessed, who witnessed to say, openly guzzled whiskey from a bottle during the six songs the band performed before the show ended abruptly. Lester passed out on stage immediately after whirling the heavy black mic stand. The girl, whose name is being withheld, was carried by friends to an outlying concession area where employees phoned 911. Lester was carried from the stage by security personnel and his whereabouts was and his whereabouts was unknown at press time. Deathstroke manager... Maybe not perfect editing. Honestly. Yeah, that, that <laughs> might be the only mistake. Gray Harris announced that management teams from the band and from Dayton Arena had agreed to cancel the show. Um, although Harris told patrons they would receive a full refund, fans began yelling obscenities, fighting, and throwing everything they could get their hands on. A race to the exits ensued, trampling dozens of Deathstroke fans in the fray. Of the 16 people taken to the hospital, only the Xenia girl sustained serious injury. Witnesses say things started getting out of hand when Lester encouraged the frenzied crowd to repeat the lyrics from a new Deathstroke song entitled Freedom. Judgment Day is a lie, you know, he reportedly yelled to the audience. All of us are going to survive. There is no hell. Only freedom. Then the band launched into the new song by that name. The last one Deathstroke played before Lester passed out. Mary was sitting next to me when I dropped the paper and fell back onto the bed, pulling my hair and screaming, No! <laughs> 
Sorry, I had, I had to, shitty newspaper article. I had to read that. Yeah, I had yeah. to read that last no, part. I understand. Um, uh, but yeah, it's like <sighs> just everything seems so shallow in this. Book. Yeah, it's really sheer. Oh, his high cracking voice didn't sync up with the sheer girth of his mammoth physique. There you yep, are. I told you I wasn't, I wasn't bullshitting. I'm gonna kill. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like, oh my god, are you Except chucky? not really. I'm just gonna kinda hassle you. <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm gonna hassle you real good. <laughs> I'm gonna tie you to a post and walk away. <laughs> I'm, gonna, oh. I'm, gonna, I'm gonna set a really unsuccessful fire. <laughs> <laughs> I'm honestly a little tired after all. I gotta go home and take a nap, you know. Oh fuck, this is ridiculous. Um Yeah, I don't know. There's a bunch of like examples of really bad writing but oh that's right when the band gets into a fight at the beginning of the book and they start having a fight via guitar riffs what <laughs> did i miss something what yeah hang on oh hang on a second i'm like are they crying. really like fuck you that's your plan yes yes yeah. <laughs> hang on hang on i'm crying okay i don't remember this Woo. um okay uh <clears throat> when our normally quiet bassist, Ricky Crazy, approached me as we convened for a sound check on the black and silver stage at the Palace in Auburn Hills, Michigan, I knew something was up. He zeroed in on me like a heat-seeking missile. You know what your problem is, Lester? Ricky jabbed a finger into my chest, his red-headed temper flashing. The only person you care about is you. It's always been like that. What are you, thinking of leaving us high and dry? The sudden loud rip of David Dibbs' drums suggested he concurred with Ricky, <laughs> and Jong Skoogs chimed in with an evil guitar riff that spoke louder than words. Dun, dun, fuck you, Fuck you, Lester. Still buzzed from the gin I had consumed on the flight to Detroit in the upper, I popped in the limo. I decided not to respond. I had heard it all before and was too high to care. Just off in the distance. Besides, Ricky could be one crazy cowboy. So I spun away from him. Hello, Detroit! I yelled into the mic, nearly causing one of our roadies to fall from a catwalk above. What? You're an idiot, Lester, said Ricky, the strength on his bass reverberating as he stepped toward me again in his pointy gray boots and faded Levi's. We've all had it. You don't care jack about us or our families, about Gray or Tina. I don't care it. too much for money, I sang into the mic. Because money can't buy me love, can't buy me love. You don't get it, do you, dude? Skook said, cutting me off. Everything you do, dominoes. You mess up, you don't show up. He's just making order. Effect, he just really wanted to eat right there. Every one of us, plus staff crew fans, were sick of it. Well, what are you going to do, John? Fire me? Huh? I yelled into the mic. I made you, man. All of you. <laughs> My words echoed throughout the palace as the smattering of vendors and pre-show guests froze, their eyes searching each other. How would you just like to do it without me, huh, Scoogs? What about you guys? You ready to break this party up once and for all? End the ride? Man, that is not what we want. Dib stood up from behind his huge drum kit, the large Deathstroke logo blazing bright behind him, generating heat from above. I don't know, David. Ricky pushed his suede cowboy hat up high on his red forehead. Maybe it is time. This thing is wearing thin. Oh, my God. Anyway. Yeah. This is, like, just an that's example like of the, the bad that's dialogue. That's how the dialogue goes throughout the whole book is just... Eh. <laughs> All right, yeah. man. It's fucking ridiculous. Yeah, so. We've been going for quite a bit here. All right. So, it, like, do you have any final thoughts here? Um, don't read this book. It's not this worth your time. This one was actually one of the real terrible ones. That I mean, I one guess of like the worst ones we've unless had in you're an evangelical Christian who, but even if you are, I would hope you would have better taste in like dialogue and writing. Yeah, there's much. Even if you want that out of a story, this isn't the way to do it. Yeah. I, the, I, again, the black and white nature of everything kind of yeah. just neutered any idea of conflict in this thing. Mm -hmm. There wasn't anything interesting about. Yeah. Uh, yeah, there was attention. no there was no like mystery as to how everything was going to end up because obviously like oh you believe in Jesus everything's going to go well so like you knew that Karen Karen wasn't going to get raped and tortured and murdered like you knew Everett wasn't going to get sentenced to prison for the rest of his life you know you knew that because bad things don't happen to good people like it's kind of bad yeah. things a little bit but it's not that bad and you'll get out of it unharmed. yeah like bad things happen but then they immediately get better so yeah it's kind of bullshit um uh what are we reading next Chris. Actually, so our next if you book, don't mind me, like, kind of, this is actually a, a decent, decent change for us because you're actually in the room with me at this point. We've been doing this over Skype for the last couple of months. Yeah. Um, you actually I, came over because you're closer to me. Now. Yeah. So I was I was living in Salem and I moved to Somerville. So I'm like back from fucking exile. It's great. You know, except for my 
shower flooding and injuring myself. Um, so we usually don't announce our next book, but I think we're going to try this out. Honestly, because Chris found this book and I just... A it's friend of, those... of mine found this book while we were uh, just kind of <clears throat> snooping through a, oh, the, okay. the Harvard Coop, actually. So it's kind of like one of those books that you can't believe exists. It's called Murder Gone Awry, <laughs> A-R-Y-E, A Baker's Treat Mystery. Yep. Um, so this is a, um, a gluten related murder mystery. Um, that's like printed. That's not your little pun. I believe that's like Tony Holmes is the best gluten free baker in oil top Kansas. Oh God, we're in Kansas again. What the fuck, Chris? <laughs> yeah, she can't <sighs> escape the middle of the country. Okay. She's the only one. But when her grandmother becomes a murder suspect, she's more concerned with keeping grandma free. When Tony's beloved and eccentric grandma, Ruth, is arrested for the murder of her arch enemy, Lois Stryker, it's time for a senior moment of truth. <laughs> Telltale tracks from a scooter like the one Grandma Ruth rides leads the police to suspect the outspoken oldster. But Tony knows her grandmother wouldn't burn a cookie, let alone extinguish a life. In fact, the case has grandma more revved up than her infamous scooter. A former investigative journalist, she decides to solve the murder herself, with help from Tony. Tony by digging up long buried town secrets but as grandma scoots in where others fear to tread Tony needs to make sure she stays not only out of jail but out of harm's way can you read the uh the, the title of the book this author also wrote on the um, front cover this is the uh she was Nancy J Para is also the author of gluten for punishment <laughs> um and the praise for gluten for punishment is this baker's treat rises to the occasion a sweet treat that's sure to delight by the way this book also includes gluten-free recipes yeah. So, so this is fucking ridiculous. Like, yeah, what the fuck? I can't I, even. I'm kind of really. Uh, the, the crux of this is going to be like how self aware of how silly this is. This and the book and is. the front of the book is like really cutesy and adorable. It's like this cute little white puppy on top of a um, um, like a baking display case, and there's like a bunch of delicious like cookies and croissants, and there's just a bag of gluten free flour. Gluten freedom? Does that say gluten freedom? <laughs> that's, that's, There's a bag that that's says gluten Satan's freedom. In, I don't know. Convincing you to be free from and the, the chains of gluten. And the the window is broken, but there's like this adorable little dog hovering over tasty treats, and it looks very like it looks like a book for like a six year old. It's really weird. I don't. Yeah, this, I'm not sure. I kind of bought this one based on cover and back. Yeah, it's alone. amazing. So whoever we, found this, I love that. Them. Is my friend oh. Uh, Rebecca? That, oh, Rebecca, you're the best. Yes. Um, so yeah, I don't know. This was published in 2014. So that's our next book. Um, yeah. I, I'm going to dive right into it, honestly, because uh, yeah. I've been far enough removed from this terrible book that I should start reading something else. It's true. My, actually, I have been reading a decent book lately. I started reading Isaac Asimov's Foundation series. Oh yeah? Just to get a little bit What's of What's that about? Taste. Robots? Uh, no, actually, it's about like... Not robots. ...trying actually. to preserve the entirety of human knowledge... Um, so that it can be relied upon later if like disaster happens to humanity. But so the, like Library of Alexandria, but not flammable. But the, the thing is, is like the the whole crux of the conflict right now seems to be like the politics of getting that kind of thing up and running, and mm. like people who would be against that shit, and for like all these various reasons. It's kind of good. It, yeah, it's interesting so far. It's kind of short. I'm probably gonna cut through it pretty quick. But uh, uh, I watched Total Recall for the first time. This weekend. All right. Yeah. It was fucking great. Some of that Ar like that's a so really good, good Arnold movie. Like so yeah, it's. I was saying like I was watching it with um, Noah, Hillary, Dawn, and Paul, and so I moved in. Basically, I moved into a house where one of my guitarists and his girlfriend live, and then our other friends live on the first floor who share our band space. So it's just metal house now. Um. So it's great. I can like see my friends all the time. So we watched uh, watched this Total Recall movie, and it was great. And I was saying, like, I can't believe that this movie's quality is not diminished by Arnold's terrible acting. Somehow it doesn't ruin it. And it it's a really mystery. It really works with the movie, honestly. Yeah, somehow. It, 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 it becomes a classic in that way. All right, well, this is getting really long, so the file is going to be fucking huge if we don't have this <laughs> Okay. All right, well, thanks for uh, thanks for tuning in. Stay. We hope this extra long episode uh, makes up for the kind of the wait on this one. Yeah, sorry, guys. I, I don't think we'll have to split this one into, up into parts, but just in case, I don't know, we'll see what happens. But. Yeah, uh, but make sure, make sure you tune in next time for the gluten-free murder mystery. Murder. Gone awry. All right, Paris. I'll catch you next time.